In just a couple of weeks, the International Association of Scientologists will be gathering at St. Hill near East Grinstead, the headquarters of the Church of Scientology, to hear David Miscavige speak about everything that they have been up to in the last four years since they last gathered in person. And I thought, what a great opportunity to talk about some of the history of the International Association of Scientologists, and today, my guest is Ruth White, who has never spoken publicly and who is involved in some key moments in the history of the IES. Hi, Ruth. Welcome to my channel. Thank you for joining me. I'm so excited to have you here. Do you want to maybe first start by introducing yourself and uh, you know, why you're here. I'm Ruth White. I've gone uh, through several last names as women do as they get married, of course, um, known by several names in Scientology. Um, I rode the Jeff Hawkins wave into Scientology in the late 80s with the Dianetics blowing up the volcano campaign. Um, actually, it was a book. The book was gifted to me um, by somebody that thought I might be able to understand it. Um, and it did, there were things in it that made sense to me. So had my first visit to an org within two years. Uh, this is a very short story, a uh, long story turned short. Uh, was on staff for a year, left staff and stayed a public Scientologist until about 2015. So, um, and in that time, there's a lot of um, other experiences. But I uh, bet. I bet. And I'm excited to share some of those stories today. I mean, firstly, I do want to do a video with you at some point going through just your journey and your story in Scientology. But this video, you reached out to me um, with all of the focus on the IAS, the International Association of Scientologists at the moment. And you said, hey, Alex, I was there at some key pivotal moments in the history of the IAS. And I thought, well, let's talk about that first. I think that's a really good starting point. So um, do you want to maybe start by explaining what the IAS is and how it came about in the very kind of early days? Well, what I understood, and it might not be correct, but what I understood it was all about was it was... Um, a way to funnel money to things that helped forward the aims of Scientology, Narconon, Criminon, um, uh, early on, at least in the early 90s, that was it. The Way to Happiness campaign, the IAS was a way to fund all these other campaigns that helped forward the aims um, and goals of Scientology, uh, which was to bring people up. Uh, that was that was the... Uh, short story anyway, um, to bring people up, to make them better, more able. So um, that was the push early on was just as, uh, just to help these, the Narconon, the Criminons, the way to happiness. Mm. And the IS exists today as the membership body of Scientology, right? You have to pay um, either an annual or there's a larger fee for a lifetime membership. You get a little card and a number and that entitles you to attend Scientology events. It entitles you to a discount on Scientology services. It's it's the membership body of Scientology. And, um, you know, it's all about their humanitarian campaigns, exactly like you just described. And the IES event that's coming up in November is the annual gathering of the anniversary of the founding of the IAS and it's a big event where um, David Miscavige the leader of the church comes onto the stage and says hey look at us look at what we've been doing this is all the great stuff we've been up to and this is what your money's been spent on in the last year and please donate more and we'll, we'll continue doing it next year um, what's your experience been like with IAS events specifically as a staff member as a public and as a, a veteran Scientologist um, well, first, I have to precursor that with um, in a lot of Scientology uh, venues, such as the Fort Harrison. The last time I tried to get into the Fort Harrison to see a friend of mine that was uh, at a wedding there it was in 2010, 2011. You could not enter a public hotel. You could not enter the Fort Harrison without providing your IAS card and your status. That's how important 
the IAS membership is. So before we get there, the other thing um, that makes it very important, the IAS membership, is that unless you're a person of influence, uh, a business owner, have a lot of money to donate, or in the public eye, the only way to, um, um, I call it, the only way to go to heaven, the only way to get to your OT levels to where you've shown enough participation is to either donate heavily to the IAS or personally step into uh, a call to arms or a call to action, which uh, have happened several times over the last few decades, where you show up, period. If the IS calls you to the front lines, you go, right? Um, you find a way to go. So um, those, but those things in the end then get you, um, get you your ticket to the OT levels. So either don't, so the IS is completely pivotal in what you do, what you contribute and what you physically are willing to put yourself into uh, for the group is how you win. Mm. And what are these sort of call to actions, call to arms that you mentioned here that you would be asked to take part in as a Scientologist? So they would, the two that were big, um, there was one along in 1992 that was a, I think it was a Narconon push, Narconon in Mexico, and Way to Happiness in Fiji, if I'm remembering it right. However, the big, the two big ones that people came from all over the planet to St. Hill. Uh, I was living in Seattle, Washington at the time, or suburb of Seattle, 1998 and 99 or 2000. We um, was the March on Berlin. They had really almost uh, been able to shut Scientology down in Germany. And um, as has been mentioned before, they have their own travel agent, their own travel agency. They have ways to get it. So they mobilized airplanes of Scientologists to leave from the States all over the world, converge on St. Hill, 1998. And I think that Paris was 2099 or 2000. I'm a little, you know, it's a long time ago. Um, to the call to arms to show up and march and protest the um, how Scientology was being viewed in both Berlin and in Paris. So those were those two big events where they just mobilized people. Their t travel agents got together, got us over there. So we attended the IS event first, um, had a little bit of time to sightsee, and then got on a, a, a Scientology exclusive plane both times to Berlin and to Paris, and uh, went over and caused a little bit of a little bit of a ruckus, you know, not so much of a ruckus in Berlin. It turned out to be kind of more of a party, but um, definitely a ruckus in Paris. Um, so those were the two events that actually live with me forever because they, they, they were life changing events. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk first before we get into Paris and Berlin? Let's talk about the IES event itself, because a lot of people have been asking what that means, what it's going to be like, what to expect. And, you know, it is a huge gathering of Scientologists. Thousands of people from all over the world descend on St. Hill, which is the headquarters of Scientology in the UK. They build a massive tent in the back garden and, you know, they Dave Miscarriage comes on and uh, reviews the year and if you are if you are able to attend you are expected to attend in person as a scientologist wherever you are in the world um and it's a hugely important thing in the calendar uh, for scientology in terms of fundraising and also in terms of uh, physical presence um what was the experience like for you as a scientologist going to the event the hype beforehand what it was like actually at the event um what was that like for you I'm going to tell you that other than the little bit over the top that the, you know, everybody's heard about the, the announcer. And of course it's that, but when you're in a sea of, I, I mean, I'm going to say it when you're in a sea of thousands of Scientologists from all over the world that you've never been around before and, and you converge there, and um, up to the event, this was way back. I mean, we're talking 90, 
98 when Berlin happened or the event before Berlin, they had it open. The manor was open for tours. The castle was open for tours. I walked into the castle and I, I, I don't even have the, I, I can't say that it's true because I don't have the photograph, but my ex-husband and I at the time walked into the castle and David Miscavige was standing right in the middle, like right at the reception desk and people were like parting him. So he's standing right there as you walk in. And, but I, I don't know, he's like invisible to everybody, but I was the dummy that's like, Hey, I'll get a picture. Um, I didn't realize at the time that it was like to, for him to say yes, either somebody wasn't there to get me away from him or something, but he did agree to it. I mean, he didn't look happy, but I didn't get in trouble at the same time. But it was such an awful picture. I was so embarrassed. In my mind, um, walking in there and seeing David Scavage was like, um, we're his flock, right? We're his like flock that he would be happy and, you know, he would, then <laughs> that's not it at all. You know, he's, he really didn't want anybody to see him. I think he was, his thing was, how can I stand here? And everybody's so in fear of me that nobody will come up but then there's me, right? So, um, but he did take a picture, but it was so horrible. I tore it up because I thought this is awful. I must be just a horrible person because he looks like he wants to puke, right? So, I mean, literally he did. He, so, so it's like, all right, well, enough of that. But it's very cool because they gave tours. We walked the grounds. You're free. We were free to walk the grounds. We saw the greenhouses. Um, if you don't, no, when um, Hubbard was in St. Hill and he was doing and applying and delivering the St. Hill Special Briefing Course, he started all kinds of other experiments with animals, plants. He had a huge greenhouse complex. So he, um, I think there's an old Gary Moore show called What's My Line that he was even on there talking about the plant experiments that he was doing. And if I could find it, I would share it, but it's fascinating. Um, whether it's true or not, it's still fascinating that he was even on there talking about it. Uh, so you can just stroll around it. You're, you, we, we, nothing was off limits at that time. Um, so it was kind of like going to Graceland, you know what I mean? Um, and then the event, right? So, um, you're right. It's way too long. It's way overhyped. And you're going, this is a little ridiculous and the four horsemen and, you know, right into the thing. But then you're with 5,000 to 10,000 other Scientologists. There's an energy to that. There really is, you know, whether it's goofy, what's going on the screen or not, you're with all these other people and all the celebs, like not even close, you're way, way back in the back, but all the celebs, like the Kirstie Alley's and the Tom Cruise's, they're all sitting, you know, right up at the front. You don't see them, but for sure, you know, they're there. So just the fact that you're with the top echelon of Scientology and the entire planet just gives you a whole nother feeling, a little bit inadequate feeling at the same time, like, oh my gosh, I'm actually here. I'm at, at St. Hill. I'm at this event. So it's a pretty big deal, pretty big deal. They have food, they have, um, there's a, there's kind of a private reg event afterwards. I got to sit in on that. I don't know quite how that happened, but I did anyway. It's like in the basement or where they used to deliver the briefing course, um, which is a little private all night regger type thing, which is, Roger meaning sales, right? So after you go to the event and everyone chaps and uh, claps and cheers and they're like, oh, this is great. Look at this amazing work we've been doing. Um, you know, the top donors are then whisked away to exactly. the basement and uh, sat down and uh, basically asked, how much money are you going to donate? <laughs> exactly. And nobody leaves. Like there's an amount put out, like a million dollars. I think that was actually the amount. And there's only like 50 people in the room. It's not like there's a ton of people because everybody knows to cut out except for the dumb ones that don't know any better. And um, I was just, I couldn't resist. I was just curious. I had no money to offer because I'd spent it all getting over there, right? That I was asked to go. So you go. Um, so I had no money left to, to, to 
to, to donate, but I sat through the whole thing almost till dawn. Um, and the funny thing is, yeah, then the next day, instead of some people went to the patrons ball, like you said, the patrons ball is the next day, but we had then the March the next day. So we, a lot of us got on a plane, another plane to go to that, but it was, it was something and nobody left until that million dollars was hit and it gets a little rough, you know, about 3 AM, <laughs> it gets really rough where you're, you're willing to like, like, can I sell, what can I sell just to get this over with? Cause you don't dare walk out. You, you have to sit, you have to sit there. You have to wait until it's done. You walk out and all, all eyes are going to be wondering why you walked out. So, so it's, it's hugely important, not just from a monetary value, you know, it's a fundraiser event. We've got to make this much money. Um, off the event out of these people but it's it's also important in terms of the um the um i suppose the impact on scientologists like you said thousands of people are there and it's it's kind of like the proof that what we're doing is the right thing we're helping people because look scientology must be the fastest growing religion on the planet because look there's thousands of us from all over the world here like it's a big show and it's a really big statement for David Miscavige and for Scientology to say, hey, look, we are here, we are present, we are doing stuff for the planet, and look, you can see it for yourselves just in the existence of the event, right? Yes, if you don't, if, you, if you're wavering at your own org, which, you know, even by the late 90s, um, it, it was. The Jeff Hawkins campaign was one of the most brilliant when I'd heard that like he was treated so badly and that said that was so crappy, it's like, are you freaking kidding me? That's, we were doing Dianex seminars that had hundreds of people in them and in, in, in Twin Cities. And by the late nineties, like nothing, cause he'd shut, Miscavige had shut it all down. So um, to see again, that many people gathered and with enthusiasm, it made you think, okay, I am doing the right thing. It's a little flaky. And, and all this weird stuff's happening and I get in trouble a lot for whatever. And I can't really say anything or speak my mind, but it must be the right thing. Cause there's still all these people that are doing it as well. And they're, and they're, and they're upstat people, right? They're, they have businesses and they have money and they're, they're doing well in life. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm with the right people because you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's the visual that you get as well. So it just keeps the delusion going because it looks right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think there's so much riding on this particular IES event because there hasn't been an event in four years. Exactly. And for Dave Miscavige, it's really important to prove that um, the IES is still there. Scientology is still growing. Um, and with all the lawsuits and accusations flying around against David Miscavige, about against the church, you know, Leah Remini's harassment case and so on, now more than ever, he needs to prove himself to Scientologists around the world that he is taking this fight head on, he's doing something, and Scientology is still growing despite what people are saying publicly, right? What do you think the feeling is going to be like on the ground at the IES event this year, just from your experience? I think to to us, it would seem like they would might be disheartened, but I think that they are going to be super excited that there's an event after four years. They're going to be wondering, where's David Miscavige? Now, in a weird way, I could go either way with this. In one way, I'm thinking, He's going to do just what he did in 98. He's going to plant himself right in front of the registrar's desk in the castle and say, here I am. Like show, I'm not afraid of anything. Here I am. And there, there are people walking by. I could see him doing that, but I could also see that it, that's, that's a long time past that he did that in the past. And he, I just don't know that he'll be able to this is a really odd thing to say, confront it. I don't think you'll be able to confront his people 
after all that time. I think he's going to be incredibly protected and incredibly, yes. he, he's going to fly in on Tom Cruise's helicopter and exactly. it'll be a big spectacle of, oh my God, look, the superheroes are here, Tom Cruise exactly. and Dave Miscarriage flying in and it'll be like they'll land in front of the manor and all the Scientologists will be like, wow, they're like, look at these action hero stars, like this is so cool, man. And then Dave Miscarriage is going to be whisked, whisked away. And then the next he's going to be seen is when he walks out on the stage and he gives his speech and everyone gives him a massive round of applause. And then he's whisked away again. And I think it's going to be a very controlled um, show. It's going to be a performance, right? Exactly. I don't think Dave Miscarriage is going to have one-to-one -one time with anybody except not, not a very anymore. select few like yeah, Tom Cruise, John Travolta, whoever else is there that's like a big donor or a big celebrity. I don't think he's going to have like a Q&A meeting with, you know, the local Scientologist, but he's going to make such a spectacle that anybody you're doubting or questioning are just going to be impressed by his presence, right? And honestly, I think they'd be more impressed if he had the guts to have his boots on the ground, just like he did in 98. I mean, he wasn't happy about people coming up and talking to him, but we were able to at that point. And I, I think that people would be more impressed that he would do that than, mm -hmm. but it, it's hard to say how anybody will take it. They'll be just so happy that we're ha that they're having an event. I said, mm -hmm. we, but I'm not in. Um, <laughs> no, I get it. I make that mistake all the time. When talking to people, I still slip up when I talk. I say like we because I'm so used and trained to talking a, a, as a we in Scientology. I still make that mistake all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, we're doing this and we do when well, no, the church is doing this. <laughs> I'm not part of that group anymore, but it's been drilled in. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So so it, that that will be um, it's it's sad. But like I said, I I had a picture. I had several pictures that were so, um, they made me sad. They were just like, I'm, I would, and they made me embarrassed because there must be something wrong with me because he really didn't want that. And why wouldn't you, I don't know, you know, but now I know, I mean, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't touch any piece of data that I shouldn't until last fall. So 2015, I was out, but I did not know anything other than an email from Debbie Cook that I didn't read because I shouldn't, right? Sure. <laughs> and, and that's fascinating. I'm exactly the same. You know, I, I was kicked out in 2014, but I still was doing courses. It was about 2016 that I considered, I stopped kind of doing courses and started to probably consider myself not a Scientologist. It wasn't until last year that I started thinking about my experience and reading stuff online, watching stuff, and then started speaking out only about eight months ago. So it takes a long time uh, to recover. And, um, you know, I think once you've opened that can of worms, it's very hard to get them back in. And I think it's a, it's a journey, right? And, you know, I you haven't spoken out before, have you? This is the first time you've spoken publicly. Wow. The only thing I've ever said, and that was to um, my ex-in-laws that um, are not Scientologists that are still connected to um, other in-laws that are Scientologists, um, I told them where I stood and how I felt and how I felt it damaged the people that, that were, uh, that are my ex relatives and that they're, they're still relatives of that, how it made them, um, it's supposed to make you more out there, more able to confront, more able to do more able to be involved with your fellow man, more able to, and what it did to a lot of people. Um, and some of my ex relatives are, are some, some aren't, but the one I was married to, he's a hermit living in the middle of nowhere and he sold everything and he quit. He retired early cause his goal was to go up the bridge and, um, he couldn't afford a lot because he retired early, but he wanted to have full time going up the bridge. So he moved to a little town in nowhere and lives there and is now a hermit hunkered down with another Scientologist that he talked into doing this that has gone a couple of times over the winter and done some services, but they're not going up the bridge and they had to hide all their materials because they're in, they're in white bread 
Baptist Methodist country, you know, I mean, it's so it's like, so how did 60, 70 years of Scientology second gen help them? Now they're a hermit, not talking to anybody hunkered down in South Dakota, just waiting for, I, I'm not sure, you know, it's just sad. So I did talk to their, their brothers and sisters and say, you know, Hey, I, I've woken up, you know, right. I, I realize what's going on and how sad it is. And they will probably never speak out, even though they have been out or not exposed for decades because they're worried about losing their, their loved ones that they're still connected mm -hmm. to. You know, and that's the thing. It's totally fine. Like you know, if people want to come on and share their story, and stuff, that's great. But you know, it's not for everyone. And some people just want to move on with their life after they left Scientology, and that's absolutely fine. And I think anybody that does come out and speak about their experience is really proud and really brave. And uh, you know, you, you're one of those now. And uh, thank you for com coming, to sort of um share your story with me and i'm looking forward i think we should do a separate video where you talk about your particular story but That's... with this one is focus right is um, and the and and some of the things that um i mean they used the two marches to actually make it a great is event and fundraiser right i mean mm. it it the the it all tied beautifully hand in hand well, this is what I was going to ask. You've mentioned these two marches, you know, in France and in Germany. Um, I want to get into that. And for those of you who don't understand or who don't know what we're talking about, Ruth, can you give a bit of a background into what they were about, why they came about and what happened? This is, uh, as far as I know, the, the, the Berlin March in the late 90s. Berlin was really... Um, and I think there's a real famous lady that's really good. Um, Amy, actually, Amy Scobie had her on that um, is a German lady that's very well schooled in Scientology. Um, and she was speaking out in politics about it. And it was getting worse and worse for Scientologists in Germany. So um, we decided to, or somebody decided we should have a march. And the march should be uh, from the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Church that was in the middle, center of Berlin uh, that was shelled out in World War II down the boulevard um, to the Brandenburg Gate and then have like a party, have literally have a party there. Uh, Isaac Hayes with Isaac Hayes. So, um, so we can show the Berlin people that, hey, we're protesting. You're not letting us in. We're human, just like everybody else. We just want to have a right to practice our religion. Um, so that's kind of what led to it. If you look at John Travolta in the actor studio, um, this has just been released recently and somebody had that on their channel. After we did this March, John Travolta met Bill Clinton and um, this was the story that we were told. Now, I don't know the truth. Is, is that the truth or not? Um, John Travolta said that Bill Clinton met him. They talked um, and he told him that we were having a problem in Germany. And Bill Clinton went to the head guy, the chancellor. I don't know who, who the president is of the German government or what they call him, what his title is. Chancellor, and, I think. Chancellor, yeah. yeah. So. And he handled it and he talks about that in the actor studio. That talk was all about the situation in Germany and what we did. What they were doing is now, whether this was true or not either. So we were getting promotions, promotional leaflets and flyers that they had supposedly been distributing in um, Germany to other people against Scientologist storekeepers, Scientologists in general. And it was all black propaganda, which is negative, negative press, negative propaganda. And it all had to do with um, instead of Jews, it was Scientologists. So literally the, 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 the material that was anti-Semitic material, but it was with instead of Jewish, the Jewish name, it was replaced with Scientology name. So they were promoting these flyers in all Scientology organizations of this is what's going on in Germany. 
They are rounding your fellow German Scientologists up. It's only a step away from them putting them on a railroad car and them being shipped off. Look at what they're doing. And they even showed the Jewish propaganda from World War II against the Scientology, which was the same propaganda. Now, did they invent that? I don't know. I never saw it anywhere other than in a Scientology org, right? So it very well could have come from the inside, just fueling the fire, because I never saw it outside. So, of course, as a Scientologist, you're going, this is not okay. Like anti-Semitic rhetoric and they're trying now they're trying to load up Scientologists on railroad cars and burn them right so who's not going to show up for that yeah yeah of course it's a fight for religious freedom right yes exactly that's exactly it no matter whose religious freedom um and I'm all about that as well the only thing I'm not for is anything that's abusive that leaves such a scar on your mind that that you couldn't even promote it to to your friends or because you you couldn't you couldn't bear seeing them do go through what you went through right so is that is is anything that good that you actually refuse to tell people too much about it because you go I can't do this to you I can't I can't make you go through what I went through that's not okay that's there's nothing about that that's 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 okay you know so that's the only thing I have against any religious practice. And I grew up with very interesting alternative Christian, mostly Christian religious practices. So it's like, I'm okay with a lot of stuff, but you know, it, if it leaves scars that bad, no, 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 there's something wrong with that. Yeah. So what, what, how did the march transpire? What was that like? How many people attended? How many people were there? What was the reaction like? So the Berlin March, we get on a plane in the morning. Um, we stayed at a hotel in East Greenstead, like almost all of us. Michael Roberts stayed in our hotel, who was an actor. He was actually, um, he was uh, the character, he played the pimp in Beretta and a whole lot of other things. He also played uh, Rain Man. He was, he, was, um, he was Raymond's handler in Rain Man. So that, yeah, that was Michael Roberts. Nice, nice guy. I, I really enjoy him. But he was there, a lot of other like semi-celebrity people stayed at, at this uh, really old, old inn. So we, ho we hopped on a plane. On our plane, it was an all Scientologist plane. So we had Regis, because, you know, who wouldn't want to be, you know, they're going to get on a plane that's closed down and nobody can escape, right? So it's a short flight, but still it's an effective flight. But we and had, a Reggie is a salesperson, right? A so there are people who think, oh, great. We've got all these Scientologists in a plane. They can't go anywhere for an exactly. hour or how long the flight is. What a great opportunity to try and do some fundraising. That's, exact, <laughs> that's exactly it. So in the middle of this, oh, my gosh, the plane was, I mean, if it could have been tilted, it would have been tilted. So in the middle of this, there's Isaac Hayes and his band, who – is another really great guy and i got to meet him and the after we got off in the berlin airport a super super cool guy um and later on he just proved himself super cool again but um so he's with his band they start messing around and playing and singing so we've got 400 scientologists we've got isaac case his band is singing playing having a good time dancing in the aisles you've got regis so you got to kind of steer around the regis but other than that it was like the craziest weirdest funnest flight i've ever been on it was it was insane because when would that happen to a normal person <laughs> you know i'm a normal person from the midwest and all of a sudden i'm on a plane with isaac hayes and his band and all this stuff going on and i'm heading to germany to march down down, down to the brandenburg gate you know it was that was crazy. So we get off the plane, we go into East Berlin, get hauled the buses to West Berlin to the to Kaiser Wilhelm Church in the middle of the square. We have kind of a rally together, and then we march. And it was a it's a long walk; it's several miles to the Brandenburg Gate. Um, nobody harassed us. We had heavy, heavy police presence, and I cannot remember the name of this person, but he's a fairly well-known 
he was a fairly well-known, I think he died of cancer. He was a fairly well-known OT trained celebrity Scientologist in, in Europe. His name was Anne Drake. If anybody knows who that was, he was blonde, but he spoke like six languages so he could communicate with anybody that we needed to. So he kind of headed our march and I so wish I could remember his last name, but he was also in Paris as well. Um, Are you talking about the guy with the long blonde hair that rode the white horse in the IAS videos? And that, is that is was it that, that in Drake? Well, it might I don't have know. Been. He was he he was kind of a European Scientology celebrity. Um, his name was I think it's that guy. Oh my gosh, super cool guy. I mean, um, but he passed away of cancer quite a few years ago, I think. Um, but he led us, and the German police were they really you want to talk about a leper colony and being controlled they hadn't they wanted nothing to do with us um but we walked we marched we were good and drake um kept s telling them things hey we appreciate you thank you so much and so we would clap he'd tell us okay this is what i told them blah 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 we clap so we get there and this was the oddest thing this is what made me this is what convinced me that uh, for a while that I was in the right group. And this is why. So we had speeches at the Brandenburg gate, Isaac Hayes then played. And there were the people that led us, the, the police officers, there were like two or three guys and a gal and they were, they had machine guns. I mean, they weren't messing around and we walked by and we had beer vendors and there was, it was like a party atmosphere. And, as we're walking and the night goes on, they started loosening up like the police officers did. And then pretty soon they started like poking each other and goofing around. And by the time it got dark, they were like totally having a time of their lives. And so here we are, here we are Scientologists in an unwanted country. They didn't want us there having a party at their Brandenburg gate with Isaac Hayes and for one night, for one night, we were able to make friends with a country. And I thought, man, this is how to take over a country. Just have a party, you know, get some beer going and have, have singing and dancing and some food and everybody's happy. And then everybody realizes everybody's a person. And so for that one night, it was, it was uber cool. It didn't change it. Um, like I said, but we turned those police officers into hating us, absolutely despising Scientologists to actually having fun. And then on the march back, we had to march all the way back to the church, to the Kaiser, well, which was a long walk after a very long day and a long night. But we marched back and we started singing them songs and they started singing us songs. So I swear to God, this is true. Anybody else that was there, please back me up because this is so crazy who would believe it, but we did. And so we're singing to them, we're applauding, they're applauding back to us and saying things. And uh, um, Andre is doing the translation in between there. And we got back to the church kind of in the, and piled on the buses. And it was the most odd, weird, um, coolest takeover of a country I've ever been a part of, honestly. <laughs> like really, cause that's what we felt we were doing in a good way, right? But I think ultimately as well, it might have felt great and felt like a win. But um, in perspective, it, it kind of must have not worked because at the moment in Germany, if you are a Scientologist, you are not allowed to hold any sort of government job, government role. You actually have to fill out a declaration. Even if you want to be a teacher in a school, you have to declare that you are not a Scientologist because it is considered a sex, a, a harmful religious group um, that is um, in contradiction with the freedoms and the constitution of Germany. Um, so ultimately, Scientology isn't banned in Germany, but it is heavily looked down upon. And um, so even though you did all this right. great stuff, it ultimately didn't work, right? But you know, Alex, I didn't know any of that until I started looking last fall because you're never going to hear it inside any kind of close Scientology. You're going to think that it's all, it might have hiccups, but 
no, we're, we're fine. You're never going to hear that. Right. So I had no idea until last fall that, oh, wow. It's like, you want to talk about getting flushed down the toilet faster than the, you can push the handle. I mean, like really, really fast. Yeah. So, um, I was, you know, I still kind of had half a thought as I don't get it. I don't agree with so many things and I'm not going to do them, but you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just a loser. You know, I, I'm so it's not good. It just isn't working for me. So yes, you're right. It didn't, it was a total optical illusion, but what did that optical illusion do? Just like you were talking about DM showing up in with the helicopter and making a big production. What it did was fuel enough Scientologists for enough time to make more money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then a couple of years later, you had to do it again in France, right? There was a march in Paris, right? Do you want to talk us a, a little bit more about that? So the same thing happened. IS event first, a uh, whole um, airplane of Scientologists from the States. I did not take that flight that time because I could take a direct flight. Um, that was way shorter than the flight that the Scientology um, travel agent had booked. Um, so I just went and met everybody over. I already knew my way, you know, by that time. So same thing, the, the, the event, the IS event, which is huge, and it starts fueling everybody. This time, for some reason, um, our plane, our Scientology plane, got delayed out of Heathrow for a long time. I mean, it, I'd almost got... It almost got panicky. It was that long that we sat on the tarmac. We couldn't that means get the plane must have been PTS, right? It if was. You're late, it's because you're connected to a suppressive person. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it, we were all oh gosh the whole, so we it it kind of wore on us because you get up so early to do this, and by the time we got to the Paris airport, whatever airport we flew into, it was like almost deserted, and and it seemed odd, but it's like well okay just not a very busy airport, I guess. So we go through the airport, no problem. We get out, our buses are there. We get on the bus. Now, unbeknownst to me, other people knew what was happening. They had pulled our permits. We were supposed to mark, march down the Jean Elysees, and they had pulled our permits at the last minute. They also had cleared out most of that wing of the airport and the cops were waiting for us. So they were going to turn us around. Like we were not welcome there at all. But we were so delayed coming out of Heathrow that they got tired of waiting. So the cops had just left the airport and that gave us time to get, <laughs> get on the buses. So we were heading, heading into the center of town when the cops detoured us. Now we got detoured to a private estate. I don't know if it was a person's home or if it was a historical place, but it wasn't public property. That was the only way we could. We had to hurry up and get off. a. We could not assemble on public property. It had to be private. So there was this big mansion, this three-story mansion, and they had a makeshift stage there. So other people knew ahead of us that they had pulled the permits. Um, that's where I met Edgar Winter. He was there on that one. Uh, Kirstie Alley was there on that one. Um, there were others, but that's who I met, um, there and Edgar Winter was actually on stage. Uh, I have a couple pictures of that. That was a kind of a bad deal because we had planned that we would have food and drink something to drink, you know, a bathroom. So we end up at this estate and I do think there were like, um, stone outhouse type bathrooms, you know, that you would go to, but for thousands of people, two toilets are not going to serve. <laughs> not enough. Yeah. yeah. Somehow we ended up getting waters, but there it was cold. It was the end of October and it's Paris. It's not that warm. And people had their kids, their babies, their little ones with no way to, I mean, we expected we would be places that there were restaurants and shops and food and there was none of that. So it got a little tense. That wasn't as, uh, it was, Berlin wasn't a blowout because it was very tiring and exhausting and it was a lot, but we, we felt 
on that day that it was a positive thing. There was nothing about Paris that seemed positive. Um, and then everybody got banished from the house, the mansion. At first they were letting like moms with little babies in there, but then they banished it because Kirstie Alley came and then she had to have a place to go. So she went up on like on the third floor balcony and is up there. So nobody else could go in. So I wasn't, I just hit me kind of wrong. It's like you, there's moms with babies and they need to get inside and they need to get stuff. But it is what it is. She had the rank that she had, the status that she had. So she got the balcony in the house and everybody else didn't. Um, but after we got done and Edgar played and a bunch of people spoke, um, we got then ushered uh, quickly into the buses again. And then the police were waiting outside the gate of this estate, wherever it was. If anybody else knows or remembers, I don't. Uh, and then back. And that was that was a whole Paris thing. The, the march that never happened in this weird private estate that was less than ideal. Um, but uh, there was that. And I never heard anything after that, what had happened. And that's when I, that was the last time that I decided to uh, step out that far. Um, and uh, for my group, <laughs> I, <Wow>. you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And can you talk us through a little bit about how the IES actually operates? Because I think one thing a lot of people don't realize is the IAS doesn't officially exist. It's the same as the C organization, right? It's a membership body and it operates through IASA, which is the International Association of Scientologists Administration. So if you donate to the IAS, it's the IASA who handle the money and spend it and so on. Um, you have some commendations from IASA, right, on behalf of the IAS. Can you talk us through a bit about the organization and how that works? Because I know you're involved in a lot of IAS stuff, right? Right, because like I said, that's your ticket to heaven. So, mm. <laughs> you know, the more the more that you can do either monetarily or physically, um, that's that's when you when, – what I mean by that is uh, if you reach the state of clear – then you have OT eligibility. You have to show why you deserve to go onto the OT levels. So those IAS and ISA commendations um, are your proof that you're what you're willing to do for your group, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, it almost kind of works like a street gang, honestly. You know, you get the tattoo, you get the teardrop, you get the whatever mark, and that's what you're willing to do. And then you rise up in rank depending on, you know, how how far you're willing to stick your neck out. Are you willing to stand in front of a machine gun in the front of a government? Yep, I did it twice, you know. And that was a proud point for me for many years. It's like I stood in front of machine guns pointed at me. It's like, psh it's just one it's just one lifetime it's a body Psh, get rid of it i'll do it again whatever i know this game it's really this is how dedicated people are in scientology and that's why that's what i want to get across in my videos on this channel it's like when you're talking about scientologists you're talking about someone who genuinely believes this is the only way to help humankind help humanity there's no um um possibility of anything else uh, that's going to help anyone. It's just Scientology, right? Exactly. Exactly. So when you're in that mindset, you're going, I'll audit it out next lifetime. No big deal. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it'll be just another, uh, it'll be another notch in my OT eligibility. So mm -hmm. you know, yeah. seriously. So, so you're going, I did that. Um, but that's, the way you get those things and that's why you want those things it's it's not just the status of oh i'm a patron or i'm a whatever that's your ticket up that's your ticket to level up in the pyramid scheme hmm. absolutely so let's talk a little bit now about the IES protests that I'm organizing. You know, 3rd, 4th and 5th of November is the IES event um, here in the UK. I'm organizing a protest. I'm wearing the T-shirt, United Against Scientology. Yay. If you want your own, you can get one on the website, um, apostatealex.com. 
Um, but ultimately, I want to I want to gather people outside St. Hill and protest and not yell abuse or harassment or, you know, you're in a cult, you believe in a Xenu. This stuff doesn't work. No, I have it, that it day in, day out. Everybody looks crazy. It makes them look crazy. Just like when Scientologists yeah. do crazy stuff, it makes them look crazy. So you don't want to exactly. look, you don't, you don't want to. And yeah, that doesn't, that won't, you know. It doesn't but, work. Yeah. I was in Div 6, which is the public facing division of Scientology. Me and too. so were you. And, you know, so I was director of public book sales. So I had people come up to me every single day and say, you're in a cult. Do you believe in Xenu? Not once did that make me question my beliefs or question my membership of the group. It just made me think, God, that this person's insane. This is what he thinks. Come <laughs> yes. on, you know, whatever. Instant block in my mind to whatever this person's saying. So the point of the protest is to try and get people to start thinking, you know, and get them to realize, look, we don't care if you're a Scientologist or not. You can believe in what you want. But, you know, are you aware Dave Miscavige is, um, you know, wanted for human trafficking? When was the last time you spoke to your family member or, you know, to, to plant those seeds in people's minds? Um, did you ever experience any anti-Scientology protests in your time in Scientology? Yeah, particularly, well, there were, even in Berlin, when we were in the square uh, by the Kaiser Wilhelm Church, there were a few um, anti -Scientology. They didn't know we were going to be there, I'm sure, just public, mm -hmm. uh, a few anti -Scientology. But mostly as Div 6. So I was public contact secretary. And so I was, yeah, body, uh, body routing is where you go and find people to bring in to do a personality analysis, uh, to sell a book to, 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 to get on a beginner service. Um, so you go out and ask them questions. There, there are certain padded questions that you can ask to get them interested. The tone scale, you can uh, present the tone scale to them. Where are you at? The awareness scale, that's another one. Um, just random things. So in that, I got a lot of that. And this was in 90, 92, 93, um, shortly after Waco, Texas, the, the, the Branch Davidian, you know, with mm -hmm. the whole fire and the F, FBI and all that kind of stuff. I did not know what that was. I did not. I, I had kind of heard of the Branch Davidians, but I didn't pay a lot of attention because as a Scientologist, I didn't watch the news. Mm -hmm. So people would yell at me, you know, like, you're a Davidian, you are, you're a freak Davidian and, you know, go down in a blazes of fire and brimstone. And I, I'm going, I'm just asking you a question. You're a nut cave. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's because yeah. that's what you're thinking. Cause you're going, it's not even there. It's not even there yeah. for you. You just feel sorry for these people that are crazy. And you go, wow, I really need to be out here doing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I think that's why the message is really important, right? And with this po protest I'm organizing, it's not to accuse people, but it's to start getting people to, to start questioning and thinking in their minds, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, just look, if, if, if it's the greatest tool and the universal solvent is communication, which that's one of the basic basics, right? Mm -hmm. You will mm -hmm. learn through Scientology how to handle or communicate with anyone. That's one of the things that is out there, right, for you to get. But yet there's all these disconnections to your own family because they're PTS or SP or, you know, that's just admitting that there's somebody that you can't talk to, right? You mm -hmm. can't, you can't talk to them. You can't communicate with them. Now you can can't even acknowledge that they exist. So now we have a half a planet that's supposed to be handled that that they can't even talk to. How's that? How are you gonna How are you gonna handle that? I mean, that goes against what we're even they we were even supposed to be doing. So, if they really even looked at that part, it makes no sense. Yeah, you should be able to talk to anybody about any subject. That's what you're promised. Yeah. And, and that's the end phenomena of grade zero, right? The ability to talk to anybody on any subject. And so anybody who's done the communication course in Scientology should be able to do that. So why would they have a problem with someone coming up to them saying, you know, negative things about Scientology? You should be able to confront and shatter that, right? As per LRH Tech. And you know what I found? Uh, the, 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 uh, 
just, this is a really interesting side note. What I found is every single person, every single channel, SPTV channel that I have looked at or followed or tried to catch up on or met as a new person um, will accept criticism, bantering, debate, um, talk about anything, let it go, uh, have a have an adult, healthy conversation about any subject. So that makes no sense. The suppressives and the PTSers from SPTV are the ones that are able to communicate to people. <laughs> it's complete contradiction exactly. to what Scientology want you to believe, yes, right? That's exactly yeah. it. That's exactly it. Yeah. We're the ones that are willing to say, all right, let's, if we have a problem, let's talk about it. If we disagree, let's talk about it. If you have a different viewpoint or opinion or whatever, or you look at it differently than I do, cool, let's talk about it. Let's, let's, get, yeah. that is, that is what they should be doing and they're not. They're hunkered down and, 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 cutting out everybody and making it um, really scary scares you for the people that are in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, Ruth, we are approaching an hour and I okay. think that's probably a good place to wrap it up on the IES conversation. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you maybe want to talk about that we didn't mention with regard to the IES? It is, um, Looking at it from the outside in, it of course looks constructed and orchestrated and rehearsed, and it's a show. Like you said, it's a definite show. Being there, even though you realize it's a show and it's meant to show strength and power and massive ability, you still can kind of get caught up in it when you're there um, participating, right? Mm -hmm. So people that protest, if, if there's people that just don't, that just aren't even connected and don't see it or can't, it's just, they are so in, like I said, I, I was like, okay, I stand in front of a machine gun and it plows me down. All right. Well, that's just a tick in my, notch for next lifetime you know what i mean so i mean you don't want to die but you are dedicated to the point where you're going to make it right for the universe that's a big area to that's a big area to be willing to own right for somebody so um i would say that i would say though everybody would be very hyped um and I think the presence is good. I think being polite is good. I think the more sanity that's shown on the other side of that fence, the better they'll realize, oh, maybe they're not all crazies. Just like I was saying, it's us that are able to communicate and they're not able to communicate. So maybe somebody will cognate on the fact that they're not being crazy. They're not being outrageous. They're actually just being really cool about it and being sane. So that's, I think, what's going to click it in somebody's head. So yeah, that's what absolutely. I would say about that. Absolutely. And I w wish everybody so much um, fun and good luck and good health with it all. Um, and I can't wait to see Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, thank you so much. And obviously, anyone who wants to uh, participate online, we will be live streaming it on my channel. So you can watch it live and take part that way. Um, Ruth, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm really looking forward to bringing you back maybe next week or the week after or something. And we can do an interview where you can tell me your story uh, in Scientology from, from beginning to end, because I don't think uh, you've done that before, right? Would you be willing to come on a, a second time and talk sure. about your journey? If you want me, sure. That would be amazing. Ruth, thank you so much. Thank you.